So hi, everyone. Um, it's really been nice to be back at an in-person conference for the first time in two years. It's such an improvement on Zoom. Um, I'm Toby Cubitt. I really am called Cubitt. And I'm from Facecraft, which is a quantum startup based in London and Bristol in the UK. And one thing about being, I haven't had time this trip, but one of my favorite things to do when I'm back over this, this, in this corner of the world uh, is, to, is to go to this museum here, which is just up the road in the Computer History Museum. If you haven't had a chance to go there, I strongly recommend it. Um, it's really interesting to go back and look at the history of classical computation back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and remember where we've come from. For example, like memory used to look like this, where you had waves traveling down a pool of mercury and then coming to the end and being cycled back to keep the bits alive. Or a big improvement on this, magnetostrictive memory, where it was torsion waves traveling down a coil of wire. This is how we stored information back in the day. Or drum memory, or core memory, all of these disparate different technologies that we've kind of forgotten about are now and are now completely obsolete. But back in the early like, wild west of, of classical computing, there were all of these different technologies that were competing. And you can go, that museum has a, this and many more that it's really fascinating to watch and to have a look at. And software development, Facecraft is a software company. So I'm also interested in like, software development and programming. And it's in, interesting to look back in how that looked back in the early days of classical computing. And I want to tell you a story about programming back then. It's a story that was told by Ed Naver, posted on Usenet a long time ago. Usenet is also obsolete by now. But it's a story about programming in the 1950s or 60s. And it's called The Story of Mel. Some of you may have heard it. And Ed Naver recounts that he was tasked with, in a computing company back then, he was tasked with rewriting a piece of software that had been written by a programmer that he calls Mel. And so was, of course, written in assembly back then. There were no compilers. There were no software libraries. Python certainly didn't exist. And he came across in the code something that looked a bit like this. Um, and he couldn't understand how this program worked. He'd run it. The program did what it was supposed to do. It ran. But somehow, it had inside it something that looked like this. So what is this? This is a crash course in assembly. So so this is some pseudo assembly. I've sort of synthesized this story a bit. But here's the memory address in the first column that these instructions are sitting at. Here's the instruction, um, and then the address that that instruction acts on in memory. And so what is this doing? So this is incrementing, this instruction is incrementing the address in the previous line. That previous line is doing some useful information to whatever data is sitting at that address. So what's, and then the final is jumping back and looping through this. So what's it doing? It's going through some array of data and applying some operation X to each en entry in that list. And um, the mysterious, the thing that mystified Ed Nather is how on earth this program ever exited this loop. Because there's no condition in this jump. It just loops round and round and round and never exits. There's no checking on some loop variable to exit this. And yet when he ran it, it would go through this loop, do its stuff, and then exit and carry on running. So let's step through it and see what's going on. Let's imagine we like, this is the instruction 1001 in binary, whatever that does, and here's some address that's starting operating at where the start of the data is, and it goes through, it increments that address, jumps back, applies the operation to the next piece of data in the array, increments it. But this is just incrementing some binary number. And what he finally realized is that when it gets to the end of the data, the way it was located in memory means that it increments this, and this carries over into incrementing the instruction it's operating, that's operating. And it just so happens that in this architecture, that instruction is a jump. <laughs> and so the program jumps back here, and then the rest of the program sits at memory address zero, and it gets out of this loop and carries on. Now, this is not how you should program. Okay, if you do this in phasecraft now, you're fired. But back in the 1940s and 50s, you needed to squeeze out everything you could from the hardware. And this saves a couple of instructions in that loop. And so Mel, who was a, clearly a really fantastically smart person at squeezing stuff out of very limited hardware back in the 50s, I know this was a saving that was worth doing back in the day. Now, history doesn't repeat itself. But as Mark Twain maybe said, it often rhymes. And when I look at quantum computing, where there's hardware that looks like this, superconducting circuits, or photonic chips, or ion traps, and various other hardware, to me, I look at this, and to me, it seems to rhyme with the 1940s and 50s of classical hardware that you can go see in the Computer History Museum up the road. And so in quantum software development, what I think we need is, at the moment, we need quantum MELs. We need people who really are able to squeeze every ounce of juice out of near-term quantum hardware if we're going to get useful applications on quantum computers sooner rather than later. So the best introduction I can give for Phasecraft is that it's a company of quantum MELs. 
And Mel, conveniently, at least in British English, is, can be a male or female name, so I can safely say that it looks like a company of quantum Mel's. Co-founded by myself, Ashley Montanaro and John Morton, and we have 15 research staff, as I said, based out of Bristol and, and, and London. All working on this problem of how can we get useful applications out of near-term quantum hardware by really deeply diving into how the hardware works, exploit it to the full, and understand the applications very deeply, scientifically, that we're trying to solve. So I want to tell you a little about one an example of what we've been doing. And when you think about um, applications of near-term quantum computing, you have to kind of think about this Venn diagram. I think Will had in his keynote earlier this week. You're looking for applications that are commercially useful. We're a company, not an academic research institute. You care about them being feasible on NISC hardware, because you want to run them sometime soon, not wait 10, 20 years for fault-tolerant quantum computers to come along. That will be great. I will retire at that point and leave it to other people, but we're not there yet. And you care about algorithms that can beat classical computers, because classical computing is incredibly good, and classical algorithms are extremely efficient and work extremely well. And you don't want to be up against really good classical algorithms is what your near-term applications. And when you populate this diagram with the known quantum algorithms, you find that there's things sitting all over the place, like random circuit sampling, which is NIST feasible. Google did it. Um, it beats classical algorithm. There's at least good evidence that it, it can if you do it right, but it's not useful for much. And even, you know, then things like Shaw's algorithm, which is not NISC feasible. Um, it, it does beat there's classical algorithms exponentially. It's not clear it's commercially useful for much unless you work for three-letter agencies. And what we really care about is what's in the middle here. And the answer is we have no idea if there's anything in the middle here at the moment. So what I want to tell you about is some of the work we've done at Facecroft to try and move some, of, some things into this intersection. And the one I'm going to talk about today is about Hamiltonian simulation, about simulating the time dynamics of quantum many-body systems. And I just put up the results to start with. If you look in the literature on Hamiltonian simulation, people have done very lengthy, detailed work in working out what are the resource costs you need, how many qubits, how many gates do you need to implement Hamiltonian simulation, simulate the time dynamics of, of an interesting many-body quantum system. And you know, this is the data, the table I've put here is for a five by five Fermi Hubbard, spin Fermi Hubbard model. So it's a well-studied condensed matter model. It's a toy model of materials and chemistry, so electronic structure systems, or Hamiltonians. And if you look in the literature, the best figures you can find from a couple of years ago, this is a paper from 2009 by a team from Google and, and elsewhere, is about 10 million. This is the T-gate count. So the circuit depth is at least something like 10 million. Now this is not a completely fair comparison because this is also doing phase estimation. So if you take all of the best known techniques in the literature and look at what they get, you know, what you could put them all together, which we did in this paper, you find that you need a circuit depth, this is now circuit depth, of around a million. And that's not a fair comparison either because that's assuming perfect quantum computers with no errors. What we did at Phasecraft is by thinking really hard at how we could better exploit the hardware and the structure of the problem we're solving, we got this circuit depth down to 259. Now, that's a five order of magnitude improvement over the previous state of the art. If you believe in a Moore's law type growth of quantum hardware, that's about 15 years of hardware development you don't need to do now to run this algorithm. If you believe in a Nevin's law type growth, it's a little bit less. Um, now, this is, this is theory work. We this is still too deep to actually run on any existing hardware, and it also makes extremely optimistic assumptions about the way errors behave and scale in quantum hardware. If you take slightly more conservative uh, assumptions about how errors propagate and behave, you lose an order of magnitude, but you still have a four order of magnitude improvement with the techniques that we developed compared to the best previous results from a couple of years ago. Okay. Hamiltonian, this, the message of this is that Hamiltonian time dynamic simulation looked like an algorithm you had to wait until you had fault-tolerant quantum computers. And after our paper, which I should have mentioned is by Laura Clinton, is the lead author, one of my PhD students who works at Facecraft, and Johannes Bausch and myself, who was in Nature Communications earlier this year. This makes Hamiltonian simulation look like it might actually be a NISC algorithm after all. So I'm gonna, I don't have much time. I'm going to really just give you a very high-level overview of the kind of sum, not all of the ideas that went into how do we get this, this circuit depth and the resource requirements so far down for this algorithm. And there are kind of three key conceptual new ideas. I'm going to talk about two of them. And one of them is to actually think like Mel did back in the 1950s and 60s of how can we exploit the hardware better. So in standard circuit model, it assumes that your hardware can perform CNOT gates, Hadamards, Pauli gates, et cetera. But that's not what real hardware does. Real hardware, you vary microwave pulses and lasers and voltages, and you use that to implement gates. But that's a layer of abstraction on top of what the real hardware does. 
And if you think about the standard algorithm, let's take the Trotter algorithm for time dynamic simulation, you do a lot of small rotations and little steps over and over again to evolve things incrementally by each interaction in your Hamiltonian bit by bit. And in the circuit model, every step you do, every Trotter step you do takes, or every interaction you advance by one step takes at least one gate. So the total runtime looks like something like T over delta, where delta is the precision to which you're sim doing the simulation to. But physically, an evolution of e to the i h delta should take, physically should take time about delta. And that would suggest that really you should be able to get a total runtime should scale as order t, not order t over delta. Now that's just a constant factor improvement. And in my previous life as a theorist doing complexity theory and algorithms complexity, it's a constant factor, we just ignore it. But this is a constant factor that goes to infinity as the precision of your algorithm, as you take, make the algorithm more, your simulation more precise. And that's a constant factor when you want to run on early stage quantum hardware. You don't want to ignore factors that diverge to infinity, even if they're constants. And it turns out that with that thinking, if you take the standard circuit de decomposition, if you're trying to evolve by an interaction, let's say a three body interaction like this, here's the circuit decomposition for that in the standard circuit model. If you think about actually how could we the hard, use the hardware that can do more than just C0 gates and Pauli rotations and exploit that, you can actually get the circuit depth of this down by, by one. So there's the circuit depth five. Here you have circuit depth four for this individual step. And also the runtime here is order one. If you take how long does it take for the pulses you're firing in to actually apply this sequence of gates, it would take order time order one, actually about pi. Whereas here, it'll take time, actual runtime of firing these pulses will take order root delta. And in fact, you can do better on circuit depth. There's actually a decomposition where you exploit this that you can actually get it down to depth three. And now this looks like small gains, right? We've gone from circuit depth five to three or runtime from order one to order root delta. But you pick up this benefit every single step of your Trotter algorithm. And you do a lot of Trotter steps in a Hamiltonian simulation algorithm. And you accrue this benefit in, uh, across the whole algorithm. So if you do that, that's one, one contribution to how we get the runtime down by thinking more about how can we better exploit what the hardware actually does. Another part of this is some new maths where all of the bounds on how errors scale in product formula algorithms were all focused on getting good asymptotic scaling. And it turns out that if you, what you really want is good numbers, you can do better than the known bounds. And there's a lot of maths in the paper that proves tighter bounds in the non-asymptotic regime. I'm not gonna talk about that. And then, but the other, only other, the other part I want to mention is that this is a fermionic model that we're trying to do time dynamic simulation for because everything interest commercially relevant in simulation is electrons and electrons are fermions. And that requires overhead to encode your fermions into qubits, which are not, qubits are not fermions. And in the previous literature, the best fermion to qubit in mapping or encoding of fermionic Hamiltonians into qubits um, for this type of algorithm was by Fostrata Sirac dating back, you know, nearly, I mean, five, 10 years now where for each nearest neighbor Fermi or two-body fermionic interaction, you needed an interaction on four qubits when you encoded into qubits. In Facecraft, two of our team, um, Charlie Derby, Joel Klassen, and, and then others on this paper, found a more efficient encoding that gets this down to, you only need three qubits per interaction, per, per two-body fermionic interaction, and the number of qubits per fermionic mode is down from two to 1.5. They call this the compact encoding. And this is the most efficient fermion, in, phase graph now has the most efficient encoding of fermions into qubits in the world. And what's better, we have a mathematical proof that no one can beat us because this is in fact optimal for these parameters. Now again, looks like small gains. You're getting K down from four to three, but these gains go in the exponent of the runtime of the algorithm. So again, this picks up a big benefit in actually how many gates and how long does this, uh, this algorithm have to run for. So this is, a, this is back to some of the results. This is more detail in the paper. I encourage you to go read it. We really analyze, this is still a theory paper. We haven't run this on real hardware. We can't. There's a lot of, data, of different analysis in there looking at different error models and how different, depending on what the hardware performs, what the runtime looks like. As I said, this, that the, the take home message is that by really thinking hard about algorithms, you can, get, you can make orders of magnitude savings in the hardware requirements you need and how soon you'll be able to run them. Okay, I'm just gonna, in the last few minutes, I'm gonna mention one other paper. That's one example of what Facecraft is doing. I want to mention this because it's hot off the press that my co-founder, Ashley Montanaro, um, together with Facecraft team and also people from Google, Quantum AI Lab, just posted a paper on Monday doing something, in something similar, running VQE for a spin Fermi Hubbard model and the biggest instance that's been done uh, to, ever to date on real, actually running on real hardware. 
And I can't tell you about the details of this, I don't have time, but again, it's the same story. They don't achieve this by taking standard off-the-shelf textbook stuff. This involved developing a new low-level optimizations targeted at the actual hardware and inventing a new classical optimizer for uh, the outer loop of the VQE, new fermionic error mitigation methods. And what they achieved is to actually go look at the paper for the details, but they actually showed the, the actual results of these real experiments on real hardware reproduced the physics of the Fermi-Hubbard model very nicely. So here are the, I'm out of time, um, here are the references for the papers that I've mentioned just in this talk, um, but the number of papers coming out of Facecraft, this is just a small sampling of the kind of things we've been focusing on in, in Facecraft, and there's a lot more, um, and I, this is not a complete list of all of the publications over the last couple of years. I'll end with a quote from, in fact, a report to the US Congress, not on quantum computation, but on information technology and computing technology. And in that report, they point, the authors of the report pointed out to, to the US Congress that sometimes theory can beat Moore's law by a multiple orders of magnitude. We need the hardware to progress, and that's for the hardware startups and big tech companies. I'm very happy they're working hard on that. But we also need to work hard on the software and algorithm side to reap the advantages of actually thinking hard about how we can implement algorithms on this early stage NIST hardware. And I think these results show the gains you can make by putting a whole bunch of smart people to work on thinking really deeply about how to do that and coming up with clever ideas. So at Facecraft, we're always hiring more MELs. Um, if you feel you are one of them, if you'd be interested in coming and working for us, do come and talk to me. And with that, thanks a lot for your attention, and I'll end there. <laughs> So gr great science and great storytelling. Uh, we're a little late on the schedule, but I will still allow a question if, uh, if anyone wants to be brave to ask one question. Here we are, uh, Alan. So you show that you can have an optimal encoding with three qubits. Would it be useful if you have a three qubit operator instead of these two qubit operators then? If you have a three qubit operator, so that you could do kind of, is it possible to do like a fermionic operator with just three qubits? If like, like, let's say you have pulse level control and you could pulse the three qubits all at the same time. Yes, I mean, then you wouldn't have to break it down into two qubit gates or two qubit pulses, but probably you pay a cost there in that that's much harder to do high fidelity operations. So it's not clear what, whether that, you have to take into account on NISC, the N in NISC. So, but it could be interesting. I mean, and again, more knobs you give me to twiddle, uh, the more that I will think about how to exploit them algorithmically. So it's an interesting question. Okay, give it a hand again for uh, our Thank speaker, you. Tony Kubik. Thanks a lot.